Finland Saga Season 2, Episode 22. Thorfinn's Gamble. 1. Oh, 16. Okay. Damn. The King of Rebellion. What is your method, Thorfinn? What is... Okay, at least it's not all his face. He said he had a method. It looks like his method is just taking taking full blows at full force. Or is he doing what I said last episode where he's using the hard part of his body or head? There's one person who made that 90 bet who's going to be very, very happy. Bear Killer is going to get tired eventually. Yeah, realization sets in. Oh, he's moving with the blows. That's a lot smarter than what I said. People aren't picking up on it. Except for the real experts and Drot. And then Drot also, his intensity should decrease, you would hope, you would think. With every punch, every blow. It's hard to watch. You must feel very powerless watching Thorfinn just getting his ass kicked. I don't know if this is the the final iteration of this. This is not gonna work. And what if it's swords, you know? I think I'm just trying to I'm racking my brains here. Thorfinn maybe could benefit from a following. I think you don't necessarily need to be violent to use force. If you have enough momentum or resources or people at your disposal, or you're powerful enough to use force, if you have a great enough force, then you have to use force less and less. Thorfinn is just facing the world right now as this small statured individual throwing himself into violent crowds. This can't be it forever. There are obviously examples in history of peaceful movements affecting large change. Even those in a way represent force to a certain degree. It's just you have uh, a sufficient wave of sentiment and a number of people so that they can actually affect things in a way that's positive for them or negative for the person they're trying to deter. There is something correct about might is right. Force does sort of underlie everything at the end. It's the last resort. It's the last tier of escalation. But if done right, if amassed sufficiently, it doesn't need to be used. That one didn't look good. Knocked his hairband off. What are we at now? What's the count? Oh, get up. What do they do, a 10 count or something? Is that it? Is, did he lose? It looks pretty out. They could have, honestly. You can feel Snake actually really cares about them. Yes, I mean, this was an experiment. It didn't exactly work out. This is not the way going forward. I understand both sides. Yeah, I don't think there was much discussion. This was really good for me to see. Honestly, it's kind of hard for me to talk about this because I feel like it's cliche and I don't really have a lot of strength with which to say this. I don't really have the backing to argue this convincingly, but this came up a lot and was my view controversially, I think, largely in Attack on Titan. There's a very common sentiment that a certain group of people in committing atrocities had no choice and that the outcome, if they didn't do terrible things, was inevitable and certain. And my argument for that has always been, even though that might be correct, it's a little bit too easy, it's a little bit too convenient, and it's definitely a slippery slope in what that allows you to do. And the implications of that belief and that logical structure of thinking is disastrous in itself because, to quote that show, who gets to decide? It's not that there isn't a choice. It's really that one choice is unpalatable and no one has faith in the alternative choice. It doesn't mean that there isn't a choice and it doesn't mean it's impossible because who knows? But conversely, for that matter, who knows the terrible things you do will lead to the outcome you want anyway? Who's to say it won't make things much worse, not just in terms of the evil you inflict upon your enemy, but even the outcome for yourself. It's a little bit convenient for me as well to point to this example because it's already happened and I know the outcome, but they assumed it was a foregone conclusion that fighting is the only way and they fought and here they are talking anyway. Here they are making negotiations. So point is we had no choice is a line anybody can use to justify anything and that's part of what makes it so dangerous. You can always convince yourself of anything. Your metrics for evaluating have to be distrusted a little bit, even if they're important. I think a really good reasoning process will contain both some objective rules or structure that is independent of you and your your own instincts, your own feelings, your own reasoning. Relying too heavily on rules, for example, risks missing the, the human element, the nuances of life and people and situations that no one rule or set of rules can 
accurately address too much individual, too much trust in one's own reasoning makes everything subjective and anything can be okay if you want it to be badly enough. This is a totally separate and unrelated example, but something I think this applies to. I feel this way about relationships. What I see is that people are very subjective about their responsibilities towards other people. Like if it's about your own happiness only, you can justify running or quitting or not doing hard work as soon as it becomes inconvenient to do so. You need to have a higher responsibility as well to be good to your partner and some kind of commitment. But at the same time, being overly committed in that way means you can get stuck in situations that are terrible for you and objectively you should leave. Though I would argue that generally what I see more is the former, where whether or not I stick to something or work at something, it depends on how I feel about it right now. I really thought the 90, 90s bet guy was going to win. I really was gunning for him. I guess there's no tank count, I think. I guess he just got up. Oh, and he throws out a taunt. They just call it middle part? <laughs> it's an odd insult. I'm a busy man. <laughs> Give me back my hair tie. Someone fetch it out of the grass. They just realized something different is happening here. I got mixed feelings. I, I admire Thorfinn's spirit so in, so intensely, but this is not maybe the this is not yeah it's not the way. This is not a, a strategy that you can win over every iteration. Total silence. Whole mood just changed. Imagine Olmar crying for Thorfinn. Watch Drot die from exhaustion. <laughs> What's the over-under on that one? He died. <laughs> He's dead. He really witnessed something today. Who the hell are you? Who is this man? He says on his knees. Do you know who the real warrior is? You probably should have worked this out before the bet, but okay. Kanu can still say no. He's the king. I got this thing called principles. Should try it. Now they're really listening too. It's pretty amazing to me watching this because my initial reaction to watching this was me relating to the frustration of experiencing antagonism and not wanting any part of it and, and feeling like you see above it and the futility of it. But Thorfinn found a way to actually get through. I don't think that's something you can do without real purity of spirit. And maybe that's part of the answer. Maybe it's example. Looking at this realistically, if this were a real group of people, there's still going to be people in the crowd who think it's stupid, who don't get it and who are mocking him. But it doesn't really matter because he's gone deep enough into the limits of their understanding and into their realm of what they're capable of processing, what they can't ignore so that enough people can't help but feel something profound has happened even if they, they don't know exactly what it is. And so the crowd has turned. I have no enemies. That vision of Thor's. And now Ulmer's ready. Maybe a twist ending. And yet... Interesting, he's a real believer in Canute, not just a soldier. Thorfinn is Einar's friend, but Einar's right there with the whole crowd. Never has someone taken a beating so heroically. I wonder what befell Bucket Man and Walk Brothers. Oh no. Oh, oh, what happened? Yeah, damn it. What happened to Potter? Finally, finally. This is such a long time coming. So much build up for this, this whole season. Yo, what's up? Long time no see. Somehow.
そなたを奴隷の身に落としたこと。No, it's so much bigger than that. So far past that. 申し訳ありませんでした。陛下のお顔に傷をつけた男。トルフィン・カルル・セブン。かつてトルケル閣下と。They did battle several times. Some of you have never seen Vinland Saga Season 1, and it shows. Feels like it's been a lot longer. Two men with visions of their fathers, totally different ideologies. False. ケティル一族の処分が済むまで戦は終わらぬ。そりゃつまり、この農場を手に入れるまでってことだろ。Who are you again? Wow! ボードじゃねえか。ボードバイナー。死をたげして、見守って、育ててみろよ。そうすりゃ、それを奪うのが。I think the right appeal to Knut is not that necessarily, because Knut has shown he's not 100% convicted in this path either. But Knut legitimately has responsibilities that are bigger than what Einar can really address. I mean, he has a, a kingdom to run. He's directly responsible for or affects the lives of who knows how many people. So Einar's argument feels a little bit small scale, and the way it would hit me if I was Knut was you're not grasping the full picture of what I have to deal with in the world that I live in. I think a path that would be more effective with Knut is the one that is more directly aligned with the The anxieties and fears he already has about his path, which are in the path to create a paradise, am I actually creating a hell? Yeah, this is it. So, what do you think? What is he gonna part the, the sea? Okay, Moses. Huh? <laughs> It's on a trip right now. I don't think that, that, that wasn't very convincing. Oh, that was the point. Okay, it scared me for a second there. I thought he lost it. I respect the honesty. I respect the honesty in the pain that it reveals. And it's perfect on the heels of the last few episodes. Although she sort of gave up and she succumbed to her injuries, Arnid was there for a second. She was in the forest of man eating creatures, but she saw the nobility. More significantly, Thorfinn just talked about God watching and came to a very different conclusion about what that means. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so pure. Yeah, it's simply, simply put, but I mean, that's really it. To me, that was way more convincing. Yeah, similar to Thorfinn, he doesn't care what people think. He gets worse from himself, much worse. Yeah, he probably could, but he wouldn't. Is Knut forcing a showdown? Does Thorfinn get to leave? Wow. There was so much build up towards their interaction and it, it did not disappoint. And it's not even over yet. I mean, even that, that conversation was riveting. I love Thorfinn's reaction to Knut's speech saying that Knut is a great man. Because honestly, at that moment, I was feeling it too. Knut is a great man. There's something really special and amazing about him. This is going to sound super weird, but at one point I was haunted by the question, how do I become more than human? Like, what would it mean to be bigger than human? Could I achieve some kind of godlike state? But reflecting on it, I think the question missed something vital, which was an underappreciation of what it means. To be human, and the fact that, in a certain way of thinking about it, as I tried to outline last episode, humans are a limb of God. You know, humans are warriors of God in a sense, if one kind of follows the clues, follows the raw truth. Contained in experience. Everything that is is a, a map 
in a sense, of existence itself. In that sense, transcendence doesn't mean escaping humanity, but being the most human, being the best human. In all that that is, you know, not ignoring any particular part, whether it be the the animal or the higher thinking, the abstract. Similarly, and addressing Knut's act of rebellion, there is no salvation in a rebellion against God. And at least to me, it is clearly not true that humans cannot find happiness. Knut has a point where he says humans basically just wander the earth lost and commit all sorts of atrocities, and that that is God's will, but I think that misses some of the beauty of it, which is that, you know, for, for whatever reason, the path of, of existence and therefore life as a subset seems to be one of discovery. Not unlike AI learning, where, you know, you don't program AI, you, you get it to learn. You put it out there and you let it explore. And you allow negative feedback to be part of the process, but nevertheless, it's growing, it's expanding. Life is intrinsically a battle in a certain sense. It's a battle for survival. It's a battle for resources. Death underpins all life. The desire to survive, the desire to flourish is part of that, and I would argue a beautiful part of it. It just sometimes it eats itself. It comes into conflict because sometimes one survival can be enhanced by another's destruction. But then enters time and abstraction and the fact that a short-term gain often undermines long-term gain. So one, it's not that humans' natural impulses are intrinsically evil just because they can lead to evil. And two, that ignores the, the other side, which is consciousness and the, the ability to step outside of one's own individual state and immediate needs to recognize and identify a bigger picture that one fits into, where you can use exactly what you are, your biological state, your very fragile humanness to align it with something much bigger than yourself, which at the most immediate stage is just the rest of humanity. To Einer's point, recognizing the individuality of him and his family and every single individual being as significant, as important as any other in a very key sense. If humans are divine and each human can be appreciated for their potential and raw value, and you think about what principles, what outlooks can be iterated again and again and again without collapse and without destruction, and even though it's a moving target, because of the the feedback and because of how conflicting sometimes even noble goals can be in their execution, you try to find the point that maximizes the respect for all of those things in the full truth of what they actually are without shortcut, you know, without the, the justification of evil, without dispensing of certain individuals as pawns towards a goal that you yourself covet. I would argue you end up being aligned with God and simultaneously farther and farther away from the, the very evils that people often attribute to God. That idea of the, the cruelty of existence or just a broader nihilism. And I can't help but feel like truth is a really vital component of that and actually comes out in the differences between Knut and Thorfinn's philosophies. Knut seems to want to like enforce a paradise through rule. I will gather my strength and I will defeat the very forces of nature itself with iron will and defy the natural state which he has concluded is just raw violence and terror and giving him maximal credit. It's not impossible he would create a society where people can live in peace but it would not be as robust as Thorfinn's path if followed to its logical conclusion. Because Thorfinn's path is more like everybody is Thorfinn. It's not like one ruler handing down the laws where people don't understand the laws, they just follow the laws. As opposed to Thorfinn, which is you don't need to enforce anything because everybody already is there. Everybody is Thorfinn organically through a really deep, profound understanding of the full picture or as close to the full picture as they can get. The other day, a close friend of mine asked me if I had been going to church recently because I've become very religious. Which kind of surprised me because I don't consider myself religious at all. In fact, I don't think that religions have a monopoly on God, or anyone does for that matter. So I hope all these God talks aren't taking as like religious propaganda or anything. I think if you do it right, whatever you call it, God or not, I think the point is truth. And while this is a controversial take, I'm convicted in the fact that there is an objective truth or an objective-ish truth, like we may not fully grasp it at any one point, humans may be too small for the full full truth. Nevertheless, some things are more true than others, there's a spectrum and you get closer and closer to truth. And as you do so, you are likely to get things that are better and better for humanity. And I think a lot of people have this truth built in. So for example, whatever you feel about Christianity, whatever you believe about Jesus, let's say, what I think you you can't deny is how powerful the, the message is of Jesus and, you know, Thorfinn bearing similar messages, how intuitively correct it feels, how we recognize the, the wisdom and beauty of something we've never experienced, probably can't do, don't see in, in real life, like ever, yet are pretty much all aligned on the message and the power of the message. Now, some people might say that's just manipulation, it's mind control, and it's definitely possible to make people believe ridiculous things. I think that kind of falls apart though when you consider time and scale. You can convince a group of hundreds or thousands of something truly preposterous, but the farther out in the world you go, the weaker it gets. And then the same thing is true of time. You can convince maybe a large group of people of something ludicrous, but if it's not connected to something universal and true, it contains the seeds of its own destruction. It'll wear itself out. It will be non-enduring. For messages to persist across the vast majority of people for an unbelievable chunk 
of human existence doesn't guarantee there's something there, but strongly suggests that there's something universal there. And conversely, we know evil when we see it. We may blind ourselves to it. We may convince ourselves something is not evil intellectually when we have a goal that is consuming us, when there are weaknesses we haven't addressed that invoke fear, for example, when emotion overtakes us and is the one leading the way. But there's a compass, there's a radar, there's a conscience that seems to be at the heart of humanity that I can't ignore. And I think that it probably is very directly a pattern in us that mirrors the pattern of something built into the structure of existence itself. And so you get nowhere by rebelling against it. You get nowhere by resisting it. You get nowhere by downplaying it and not understanding it and trying to, let's say, transcend it. I believe you do the best by making truth the commitment, whatever that means, even if it's uncomfortable at times, even if it's not the full truth, but like closer to the truth, you know, just a, a slightly enhanced idea than the one you had before, et cetera, et cetera. And you get to full alignment with that, you will be in the best part of God's grace. And there will be no more need to rebel. There will be no more need to transcend. There is nothing higher, maybe. I mean, like, like I said last episode, what could be a, a higher goal than being a warrior, let's call it, of God. What could be greater than being the the greatest thing that the universe gave you the potential to be? To, in a very flesh and blood limited form, be the embodiment of the glory of all of existence, even if that includes a full understanding of its pain. In this interaction, it is so clear to me that Thorfinn is closer than Canute. It is not clear to me that Thorfinn will win over Canute. But what makes me optimistic is that, to zoom out, Thorfinn is a link in a chain. Thorfinn will have a legacy. Canute will have a legacy. But like I was saying about thought, the truth, I think, wins over a long enough time frame. It's just more powerful. And I think that's been, to a large extent, even though there's still plenty of evils in the world, the history of humanity. What gives me some hope, though, for this interaction specifically, is that, speaking of truth, Canute is not blind to it. It's in him somewhere. He can feel it. And so he's not totally gone. On some level, he himself may want the very things Thorfinn is fighting for. Mm -hmm.